It's time for Victoria's Gluten-Free Gastro Gab, your source for living your best gluten-free life. Today, Victoria talks with Karen Hertz, CEO and founder of Holla Daily Brewing, Colorado's only dedicated gluten-free brewery located in Golden. And now here's your host, Victoria Wolf. Thanks, Rich, and welcome to my home kitchen. Today, we are joined by Karen Hertz from Holla Daily Brewing, and we're gonna enjoy pizza and beer, which is like the best combination to ever exist in the world. Part of the premise of the show is I ask all the guests what their favorite food is, because I wouldn't want to turn it into a dairy-free and gluten-free pizza, and Karen's favorite food is Thai. And I'm like, cool, I can do that. Yeah, maybe I've never had Thai food before. Maybe I've never made Thai food before. But you know what? It was a great challenge. I did my research, and we are going to make a Thai pizza. I'm going to introduce Karen here shortly, but I want to get the pizza in the oven so we can have a conversation while it's cooking. And then we're going to eat the wonderful Thai pizza and pair it with all her amazing, not all her beers, with some of her amazing beers. She still has to drive home. So. So we're starting, obviously, with our 10-inch pizza crust. And Thai food, um, the, the Thai sauce is made up of a... Uh, fish sauce, tamarind, palm sugar, uh, that, that's pretty much the base of it. Now, tamarind, I had to figure out what tamarind is. It is a, it's a pod, it's a fruit, it smells funny. I'm just gonna say it. I, I mean, I'm new to Thai food, but when it's all put together, it's a delicious thing. And then palm sugar, um, is actually from a palm tree, and it, and it comes um, in a cake like this. It comes in many different forms, but you, you take the cake, and then you, you chop it up really fine, you mix it in. The sauce, when it's all said and done with the fish sauce and the tamarind and the palm sugar looks like this and it smells a little funky. Have you ever smelled just the, the Thai Whoa. sauce? Yeah, you can see how that, that, mm -hmm. might, that might not go well, but it's when you put everything together. Nice. Now, we felt that the sauce would be too strong on the pizza, so what I did is I took the, the, the pad Thai sauce, I added some vegan sour cream and some nutritional yeast. Um, nutritional yeast, I use that a lot when I do um, dairy-free pizzas because it adds a lot of um, umami to it and a lot of depth of flavor. So this is the sauce I made, and I'm gonna first put that on. And you can put the sauce on as heavy or as light as you want. It looks kind of funky, but it, it does, it tastes great. And dairy-free pizzas are their own little uh, strange animal because you don't have cheese to bind everything together. Okay, so this is my shrimp. Oh, we're having shrimp pad thai. I forgot to mention that. This is my shrimp, garlic, onion, and shallot mixture. This is kind of the heart of the pizza. And the recipe will be available on the website. I have a secret ingredient in here. It's not really secret. In pad thai, they call for what's called preserved radish, which is kind of like a sweet and salty um, dried radish. And I couldn't find preserved radish, so I found just dried radish. And it is really amazing. If you dare, try one of those. They're really, they're not bad at all. It's, it, you, it's, right. it's not gonna freak you out. That's the thing I had to do is try everything all by itself. And some of it scared me, but, mm. I, was, but I was good. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And it brings a lot of salt and um, mm -hmm. flavor to the party. Yeah. So this pizza, like many pizzas that Rich and I do, have a, a warm component and they have a cold component. So all these ingredients over here are gonna go on after the pizza gets out of the oven. So that you have that, that balance. Kind of like with any dish, you have the hot part and then there's garnish. And so this is all of our garnish. So I am gonna put this in the oven. Okay. And Rich, you're gonna watch on my pizza? Yes. Okay, okay, and I'm gonna slide over here and we're gonna have a conversation. Perfect. Looks good so far. I know, it smells really good. This was, this was kind of scary because of the whole Thai thing. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I don't, I, don't, I'm, I love challenges, so. Yeah. Uh, but we were, we were in the kitchen, when, when did we, we test this? A couple days ago, and Rich is sitting over here going, that doesn't smell good, uh, I'm not sure about I'm like, don't you doubt me. Well, unique, fun <laughs> stuff. And then it all blends together. And yeah, really and it good. all works. So yeah. now I got to have to make some pad thai. All right. I love it. So Karen is the chief brewista. Did yeah. I say that, that right? I, I had trouble with that word. Title. And that, that, that's an amazing title to have. So tell me a little bit of my, okay, my love for pizza, Rich and I's love for pizza goes deep and they're passionate. And right. I, I, your love for beer is the same. So tell me a little bit about how you came to love beer so much? Um, I think growing up in Colorado, it's such a beer state, and I, uh, out of college, ended up working at Coors Brewing Company, so had work experience in the industry, 
Um, and beer in Colorado is tied to so many activities like sports. Everything. Sports, yeah, <laughs> everything. But, you know, sports games, and, and I love going to Rockies games and Bronco games and um, tailgate parties before those, and beer is always a part of always, all that. Always, yeah. Um, you know, opera ski is a very big thing around here. So in the, you're in the mountains, and after skiing, you want to have a, a beer. It's tied to that. And, and everyone's outdoors so much, so... Beer's tied to all those activities as well, and having it in a can makes it so you can take it to those places. So I think just being a part of this culture, I'm a Colorado native, born and raised here, and working within the industry made it even stronger. Right, yeah. that, that totally makes sense. So before you had to go gluten-free, did, did you drink did you drink a lot of beer? Not, not, did you drink? Did you have a pro beer problem? No, I'm not asking that. Um, <laughs> I drank a lot of beer. Did you drink a lot of different beers, or did you have some that you that you liked more? Some people will like go to Old Chicago and and drink every one right. of their 110 right. beers. Were you that beer adventurous? No, I was not that beer adventurous, and I really um, got my gluten intolerance diagnosis kind of when the craft beer industry was starting to explode. Um, so I missed a lot <laughs> yeah. of those beers. So a lot of times we make a beer in the tap room that I've never tried before. So I'll taste it and say, does this taste like a Saison? I don't know what a Saison is <laughs> supposed to taste like. Uh, so I'm learning a lot about the different styles as we go from our our brewers that are the, the experts in there. Oh, that's really cool. Which is cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things. I know when Rich and I got together, there were tons of foods I had never eaten before. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm eating all these things I, I'd never tried, was afraid to try. I mean, the list is like so long. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and then just like with the Thai pizza, it's like, I've never done that. But I, 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 he's eating Thai. I'm like, does this taste like Thai? And Perfect. he's like, yeah, it tastes just like Thai. And I'm like, woohoo. Perfect. So now I know what Thai exactly. tastes like. So yeah, that's exactly but how I feel at the brewery sometimes. Too. Thai is something you um, do you find that you can go to Thai restaurants or do you have any gluten issues there? Because there can be a lot of soy sauce in Thai there can as well. Be. Thai, you know, it seems like, and I'm not an expert in any way in this, but like Chinese restaurants use a lot more of soy sauce where Thai uses a lot more peanut focused, curry focused ingredients that seem they have a lot more gluten-free options. Okay, so they have less, less soy. I actually put yeah. a little tamari in this sauce yeah. just to give it some depth. And um, thank goodness for tomorrow, because yeah. I, I don't know what I would do it's without a it. Saver, and fish sure. sauce. This have you used fish sauce in cooking before? A little bit, yeah. If you could put fish sauce in everything you make, and it gives that it doesn't taste fishy, right. but it gives that little bit of umami. I read um, many years ago, some chef was talking about making mac and cheese or something. He's like, my secret ingredient is always fish sauce. Really? So I'm like, so I've been putting in everything, and I every sauce, everything I do, I put fish sauce in, and it, it, it makes a, a huge difference. Yeah, the name kind of. Scary. Makes you think you should like, put it no. in. And um, there's uh, and <laughs> in, in my research for the Thai, I found this brand, and we had been buying other brands, yeah. and it was recommended by the person I got the recipe from. Right. Um, and it's it's a it's a really good brand. Good um, to know. Yeah. So if you do you make Thai at home? Have you made? Um, I've tried a little, but I haven't been as successful. Oh, I found this really great recipe that I, I kind of took it and added to it, but um, I think it's the sauce itself that's important. Yeah. And this is a traditional, authentic Thai. I'm excited. I'm excited yeah. to try it. Yeah. I, I, I did, will look it up. I did learn that if you find a recipe for Thai anything that involves ketchup, run as fast as you can. Oh. Yeah. Because obviously good to they're know. out there. Yeah, yes. So. Huh. So tell me about um, tell me about the brewery, how that how that came about. I mean, yeah. being a beer lover, I mean, it's one thing to love beer; it's exactly. another thing to go, "Hey, let's start a brewery." <laughs> it's totally different. Yeah, I um, it kind of was just a combination of my education and my work that I had done in the industry, and then the health issues I ran into. I have an MBA in entrepreneurial studies. Didn't really think I was going to be an entrepreneur. I did it more because I couldn't pick a track. You know, I went into an MBA program, like you gotta do marketing right. or finance, and I couldn't pick which one. So that gave and you I a loved love entrepreneurship because it let me learn a little bit of everything. Oh, that's good. Um, and I loved it, and it, you know, it was probably, I, I don't know, serendipitous that it all worked out that way. Um, and then worked at Coors for about 10 years, and then after that ran into health issues. In 2007, I was diagnosed with melanoma Oh. 2008, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer oh my. and Hashimoto's. And Hashimoto's can be very related to mm -hmm. celiac mm -hmm. and gluten intolerance. It's an autoimmune, correct? Skin yeah. issues too, eczema, like we were talking about yep. earlier. Um, and, you know, I don't know if the melanoma was tied to it at all or not, but skin issues and thyroid issues 
and my doctors were like, we think you should be cutting gluten out. I was very sad about beer. I felt like there was a oh, lot yeah. of replacements. Beer for you, pizza for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was the <laughs> same feeling, right? Yeah. I, I could either replace it or not need it. Um, in yeah. most cases, pizza is one. Like for it's, you, it's, it's not, so this, hard. It's not like it's a three-month diet. It's no. like, okay, I get my beer and my pizza afterward. This is this for the is rest ever. of our yes, lives. Forever. And so you you have to be happy. It's a, it's a lot to ask somebody to say, oh, you know, just live without it. I mean, exactly. gluten isn't just beer. It's beer and pizza and pasta and cakes. I mean, it is it probably is. the biggest food group. I mean, oh, I in America, for sure. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a lot to go through, yeah. and I I mean, there's a grieving process. There, there's uh, it's it's just crazy. So it, yeah, I was never a beer drinker. Yeah, I never liked beer. And what's interesting is when the first time I had your beer, I started here on the light beer. On the favorite blonde. And yep. because you know I was drinking German beers way back when I did drink it. That's about all I could tolerate. Right. And um, and I'm like, oh, this is really good. And then I the stout. I was like, there's no way. If you would have told me like. 10 years ago, you're going to be drinking stout and you're going to love it. It's cool. like, to me, it was the grossest thing. Yeah. But yeah, my palate changed over the last few years too, but you're, the stout is my favorite. Well, thank you. It's so, just yeah. so delicious. And But I never liked beer, but your beer I like. And I often wonder if it's also have something to do with the, my body's like, no, this is this is too much gluten before I actually yes, knew. Yes, before you knew. Because it just wasn't appealing. I, I love all your beers. Thank and, you. Yeah, yeah, we get that feedback a lot on people having maybe not realized that you know it was kind of making them sick to their stomach or just just didn't sit feel well, bloated, bloated yeah. yeah that's all what we get frequently uh, and when they have our beer it doesn't turn out that way so they feel better on it and ultimately i with this diagnosis was missing beer just like you were missing pizza um the emotional part that you refer to is tough and, it, yeah. and um people don't fully understand it to something really gets taken away. And then you also feel high maintenance to your friends. Oh, yes, I'm in a restaurant. Oh my God. It's the I worst. never wanted to be that person. It's totally I know that person. You're and totally in, that we're person. both dairy free. Yes. So that's even an added in a restaurant. Uh, you have to ask all these questions. And I, I want this, yeah. but you have to take off this, 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 this. Yeah. And your group, you know, is like, well, where does Karen want to go? <laughs> yeah. The, you, <laughs> What's know, his, you know, yes. so you do feel high maintenance. And um, to walk in and be able to have any beer on tap, know that it's safe. We get a very emotional response from people, which is really rewarding. Um, and I hadn't taken it that far in the beginning. I was just like, I just want a beer right. at a football <laughs> game. Like, this is really simple. Um, but it's getting, it's just reaching people's emotions. And it's, it's fun to see that piece of it and to just help people feel normal. Right, because a there is a, beer. <laughs> there is a norma normalcy that, that yeah. goes by the wayside when you have to take out such a big part of your diet. You feel you don't feel normal and you feel less than at almost every gathering that involves food or, or beer Absolutely. or drink. It's, it's like before, th this was the driving force for us. We, we really did not set out to start a business. We set out to, to make a decent gluten-free pizza. That's what that's we say. That's I did the too, truth. Yeah. But you know, we would go out prior to that and Rich would get a pizza, a beautiful, amazing pizza, and I'd get this pizza on a competitor's crust I won't mention that looked like a frisbee and tasted like the box the frisbee came in. Exactly. And it's like that's less than eating. That's not fair. Nobody should have to go. I don't care if it's gluten or dairy or you know garlic, whatever. It, nobody right. should have to deal with that. Yeah. And so you're providing a, a way for people to enjoy with everybody else. And and it's not like it's you know orange colored or something. They're like, oh, I know you have gluten free beer. It's like it. It looks like beer. It tastes like beer. Yeah. Most people probably, you probably get that all the time yeah. from the loved ones that come in with the gluten-free yeah. and they're like, oh yeah, I'll drink it. Yeah. yeah. And then they drink it and go, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> this is this is pretty exactly. amazing. Yeah. And the goal wasn't, hey, I see this niche. Let's like make a mediocre something to fill it. It was, let's let's make great craft beer that happens to be gluten-free. Yep. Same with your crust. If people had it, they wouldn't know whether it was or wasn't in those then the consumer just gets to enjoy it as if they would enjoy any pizza and beer. Right, and then the whole family, the part of, you're doing exactly what we're doing is we want to include all the other non-gluten-free members, so you've got to make exactly. it good enough that the people that don't need to be gluten-free don't turn their nose up and say, here, you have yours, 
and you, you know, yeah. and, and we have ours. And I lived in that yeah. situation before Rich and I met, and that that was very difficult. I would I would make food for my son and yep. my ex, and then I would make my food. Yeah. And I had my little corner of the kitchen yeah. where I made my food, and yeah. Um, yeah, that's no way to live. But I run into a yeah. lot of people that are still in that situation. Yep. Because the family does not want to go fully gluten free, gluten -free. Yeah. and so the more products that are available, that'll make everybody's lives easier and, and yeah. family lives and as well. And it's, you know, one more way of isolating that person too without even right. realizing they're doing it, but you f there's that high maintenance feeling you get. Yeah, and it's isolation, it. that's what it, it is. It really is, yeah. I think one of the worst feelings I have is I go out to eat, go to a restaurant, and I, I know I might be able to eat a few things there, and then I get there and the situation has changed, and I really only can eat like a salad. Right. I mean, it, I feel like a little whiny baby, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's that feeling. It's like, well, I want my food, you know, yes. but you get so frustrated with that. And yeah. um, I don't think until you've um, eliminated a major food group from your diet, you, right. you can understand yeah. how that feels. Yeah, but I agree. How's the Same pizza, thing. Rich? Looking close. Smelling good. I, I like that I have a, a pizziola. Pizziola to uh, five minutes. We got five minutes. <laughs> so let's um, right. let's talk about the beer before we get the pizza in front of us. So okay. you chose to pair the tie with the stout. So you want to talk? Um, I and did. Are those my glasses? Because I really would oh, like a sip I of beer. I think there's a display. Which did one you would take? you like? Would you like the stout? Oh, Rich is giving. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> yes, Thank I you. love the stout. So why cheers. did you choose the? Yes, cheers. As well. Are you happy? Um, I tea? chose the stout. For this particular pizza, um, often in Thai food, there's peanut in part of the ingredients, and I just feel like the rich, chocolatey, mm -hmm. darker side of the beer would pair really, really well with that particular flavor. Um, you know, something about tastings with beer and, and any food is it, it's different for everybody. Yeah. And yep. someone might totally love this combination, and someone might totally love the blonde with the pizza and, and blonde and pizza go great together all the time. Um, so it's a fun experiment. I think people don't always think about pairing food with beer. No, wine, of yeah, course. Yeah, wine, everyone, given, yeah. that's, they're, they're quick to say that. But beer is, is way more complex than people think, mm -hmm. um, and craft beer especially, because that's the whole point of craft beer. So, you know, from smelling it to tasting it, all of that can be combined with the food that you're you're pairing it with. So it's more complex than just a really light beer with pizza. You can pick different flavors and get a totally different experience out of it, which is cool about craft beer and all the great flavors that people are coming up with. Right. I, I think it's great to pair beer with pizza and anything else you're eating, because especially your beers, because I love them all. Um, <laughs> so, ta so I know nothing about the beer making process. The most I know is I grew up in, in Florida and in Tampa is Bush Gardens and yeah. that's Budweiser. And I remember I, when I was little, I took the tour. Nice. And then when I came out here for the first time, I took the Coors tour. That's my extent of knowledge of beer. Yeah. So I do know a little bit that um, you do something completely different than say New Planet, obviously, um, what's that other one starts with the, the gluten removed? Omission, omission is one of them, yeah. and then uh, some of the others. So talk about why your process is different yeah. and creates such amazing. Yeah. Beers. Well, you had mentioned gluten reduced versus gluten free, mm -hmm. and there's a pretty big difference between those two. And it's good, great information for celiac um, diagnosed and very highly sensitive gluten free consumers to know. And that is that gluten reduced beer has gluten in it. It really is made with barley or wheat, and goes through a traditional brewing process. And then at the end, they drop in an enzyme, which takes a gluten protein that might be a certain length long and just cuts it into pieces. Oh. But the gluten's still in the beer, just in very, very small forms of this protein chain gets cut up. Um, so people with celiac and people with high sensitivities can still get sick from this beer. Oh, okay. That's what I, I always thought that I've never gone in that yeah. direction because And some of people that, have, so. you know, they'll try it and there's a lot of confusion with it between the retailers and the consumers, and then people are like, why did I get sick? And a lot of people do get sick from it, so it's just something to be very aware of. Some people can drink it and be okay. Other feedback I hear in the tap room is like, I can have one or two and then I start not feeling good. Which means they should not have any if they have celiac. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, I, and those beers did exist before I started, but really I wanted to make something that no matter what, you could just have this beer. So rather, when you, when you make beer, there's only really four ingredients in any beer. 
Um, and it's water, grain, yeast, and hops. So water's gluten-free. Mm -hmm. The yeast we can find gluten-free. Um, hops are gluten-free. Mm -hmm. And grain wants the trick. So grain is barley or wheat, and that's what most of these beers are made with. Um, the, not our beers, but the traditional beers and even right. the gluten-reduced beers. And so what we use to replace those grains are millet and buckwheat. So we found a company actually here in Colorado that prepares the grain for us just like you would barley or wheat, but her facility is completely gluten-free and she does it with millet and buckwheat. So that allows us to put those four ingredients together and make a whole range of beers. So the, the millet and the buckwheat combination, that's all you're using, you're not adding anything else to it. So what you're doing with your beer is, is really replicating what either the wheat or barley would do from a flavor profile. Right. Which is, which millet and um, buckwheat are very flavorful grains are, yeah. compared to like rice flour exactly. or something like that. Yeah. And I mean, even so, sorghum, something we use in, in some of our products uh -huh. and that, um, that's a pretty flavorful grain. I've yeah. never tried buckwheat and millet in, yeah. in anything. Maybe, maybe Try down the road. Yeah, you, you know, know, there's like, I've heard a lot of buckwheat pancakes and yeah. so maybe. And you always have to tell people, no, it's not really wheat. It's yes. just the name. Oh, yeah. yeah. That can, it scares a lot of people. Yeah. People do can get confused. Um, this company that we source them from, it's Grouse Malt House. But it's a really cool concept that she had ahead of me wanting to make beer was providing ingredients for people to make beer that are gluten-free. Gluten -free. To make an at-home beer? The, their yep, beer there's home brewers that can do utilize it, and then there's commercial breweries that can do it too. And I mean, something to note just about gluten-free beer is there's 7,000 breweries in the U.S., and only about 12 or 13 of us are dedicated to gluten-free. 7,000? 7,000, and only 12 or 13 are gluten-free. Wow. And so some of the other um, gluten-free beers are co-producing with, right, alongside of glutinous beers. Some, yes, yeah, some are, um, but of these 12 or 13 breweries, all we're making are gluten-free. Gluten -free, so that's it. Um, so yeah, that's, there are other beers that are made on the same lines, um, but it's best to focus on the ones that are certified because that's the way you know that production facility is really right. Then safe. you never have to worry. I, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't buy anything that has the the warning on it made yeah. in a facility, but yeah. processes wheat because I just I don't I don't want to worry. I have enough to worry about. Right. Not, you know, trying to avoid the actual wheat and dairy. Exactly. Um, is the pizza done? We're ready. Pizza's ready. If you're is it ready? ready? Oh, it's right there. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm gonna get up and, and do this. Okay, let me get this out of the way. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're garnishing. And I have chosen some crushed peanuts. So here's the peanut yes. aspect here. I saw some pad thai recipes that had a peanut sauce, mm -hmm. um, but I really just wanted to go as traditional as possible. Okay, I've got some green onions. I think Thai food can be really spicy too, some of it, and I'm a spice wimp a little bit. Oh, good, because I am too. And I met, I, Rich is like, you better call her and ask her. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to make it so I can eat it. So yeah, you can spice it up for sure. Okay. Um, and then this is the um, pickled radish. It's a quick pickle, which um, uh, doesn't mean that you have to, to heat it up. Usually with pickling, you heat it up. But a quick pickle is just sugar, salt, and rice wine vinegar, and you yeah. let it sit. And that looks so good. And then I'm going to finish with some cilantro. And I think cilantro is an acquired taste. Do you um, like cilantro? I, have, I love cilantro. So I, I, I'm hit and miss. I had these lettuce wraps not too long ago. They had a lot of um, cilantro in them, and it was, it was, it, um, it was too much cilantro. Yeah. I, it's like I have a threshold. Yeah, okay, I have a buddy that can't do it, and I just love it. So I think a lot of Thai food has it, which might be another reason I like Thai foods. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's all coming together. Okay, I should talk because this other board, it's boring because this is a podcast too. I'm cutting the pizza. <laughs> if you're not watching the video, I'm cutting the pizza. I'm cutting it with a very large 10 inch chef's knife because when you do dairy free pizza, no cheese, um, all your toppings want to go away when you, you know, when you roll it with the pizza cutter. So if you cut it like that, you have more control and it keeps a, a lot of the, the ingredients on the pizza. Okay. Oh, see, I lost a shrimp. There's a piece. <laughs> Rich, are you eating too? Would you like a piece? Of course. Heck yeah. You have beer, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to 
I'm picking this piece. Yeah, for me, I think cheese is almost, um, it's the thing that holds everything together. It is flavorful, but yes. uh, it really does hold things together. Um, so when you're making dairy-free pizzas, that's always, always a challenge, is what's going to hold everything together. Okay, let's give this a try. Let's do it. I'm so excited. Oh, it's so good. Wow. Wow. Tons Since of flavor. Since you're the Thai expert, oh, <laughs> does it taste like Thai pizza? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you. I can pull out what you had me try earlier. Mm -hmm. Yep, that kind of gave it um, a, a depth of flavor a little bit. So and, and good. It's really produced, it's providing all the salt in the dish too. It is very salty, but. Um, what is it called? Again? It's, a, it's a dried radish. Ooh. And you can only get it at the Asian store, Pacific Marketplace. Okay, so I'm going to try some beer with this. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that does pair really, really well. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Okay, this is delicious. I love being adventurous with pizza. Most people think pizza is red sauce, pepperoni, cheese. Yeah. And it's like, you can make anything into pizza, as we're doing. <laughs> and it's really about, it's not about how do I take pad thai, which is noodles and, and, right. and protein and, and veggies, and put it on a pizza. It's you take the flavors of whatever you want to put on a pizza, not necessarily the components, because you can flavor things differently. Um, it doesn't have to be. Like, we did, you're not missing the noodles. We have the pizza. Mm -hmm. Pretty much everything else is in here, though, <laughs> I have think. No, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that now. Let's see. Okay, so which um, duty calls? I'm gonna do That's from darkest IPA. to lightest. This is the IPA. What is okay from someone mm -hmm. who knows nothing about beer? Yep. What is an IPA? Well, um, really, it is a. It's India Pale Ale is the name of the style, but ultimately, what it is is it's a hop forward beer. So, hops are the. You know, it's a. It comes from a hop plant, but they really provide. Um, citrus flavors, um, more of the, you know, you have the malt side, which is the grain, and then this other side, which is more fruity, citrus, aromatic, all of that. And IPAs are just, our beer is really focused on that portion of the ingredients. So you, might, you will have a malt base, kind of a grain base flavor, but ultimately what's coming out. You're really out, tasting the hops mm -hmm, more than anything, which I do. Aroma I, of those hops. Um, and it provides a lot of with like a really flavorful pizza, you're getting like, whoa, there's a lot going on in mm -hmm. that, most likely. Yeah, um, I would say the stout is a better pair. But now I know what an IPA is and I understand it. And again, at Bush Gardens, when I used to go, you always walked, but the brewery was right there in Bush Gardens. Mm -hmm. And I always smelled this really strong smell. And I know as I got older, it's hops. Mm -hmm. The place has smelled of hops. I bet it did, yeah. So that's how I know that this smells just like Bush Garden. Right. No, that sounds and really kind bad, of on a Yeah. <laughs> kind of on a reverse, you know, we, we said the stout was real good with the real flavorful pizza. An IPA would be great with, like, chocolate. Oh, you know, right. yeah. Because it just, a blend of, like, complex flavors with something really smooth is kind of how I would pair it. Um, but like I said before, it's sort of up to everybody how they want to do, do their own thing. And then we have Favorite Blonde here, too. Okay. Do I have two of the same here? Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to encourage? <laughs> you need it. <laughs> the stout with the pizza. It's really good. Do you want another pizza? That's really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. It's really oh, good. geez. Thank yeah, you. If you want it, it's done. Perfect. I'm going to have another one because I have beer in the fridge. Mm-hmm. This is the favorite blonde. So favorite this blonde. Is first one, yep, right? this is our flagship, our first beer. Um, and it really pairs well with everything. It's just a light, refreshing, easy drinking beer. Oh, yeah, I can so that one can go. Strongly yes, yeah. they're is in there. Give it the, is it the extra hops that gives it the darker color, too? Is nope, that's more the grain. Yeah, the oh, malt okay. gives it that. So okay. um, it's a little bit darker, heavier on the malt. This is more of just a light, refreshing beer. Um, pizza and beer, this is always a good. Mm. Good pairing. What is your best seller, though? The blonde. blonde. Yeah, favorite blonde. Do you find most people go for the lighter beers mm -hmm. that are a little, 
because the beers get darker, they're a little more apprehensive. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. um, we're a light beer country. We're mm -hmm. not like, you know, England or... or exactly. Or In the tap room, though, our IPA outsells every beer. Oh, and okay. IPAs are kind of hip, you know? We it's call like it PBR was a few years ago. the magic three letters, IPA. So in the tap room, the IPA is amazing, and it does really well at distribution too, but the biggest seller distribution-wise is um, the favorite blonde, and part of that could be the alcohol content too. So the blonde is a 5% beer, mm -hmm. where the IPA is a 7%. Oh. So maybe you'd have one or two blondes, you know, or two or three blondes and only one or two IPAs. So that could make a difference. Well, that makes sense. Now, yeah. The green can, Fat Randy. Uh huh. Where does Where does Fat Randy fit in? Um, Fat Randy is my husband's best friend since kindergarten. Um, I met my husband in college, and Randy was his buddy there too. Um, we call him Fat Randy. He's not fat at all. So I just thought it'd be funny to <laughs> have a gluten-free beer named Fat Randy. Um, and the story on the can is that we were all skiing in Jackson Hole, and he took a huge spill and it's actually on YouTube you can look up Randy Wipeout Jackson Hole oh, on YouTube wow. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty classic so I just told him I'm like I'm putting you upside down in the snow on the can <laughs> um, oh, that's the so he's a great player. friend and um, it's just a funny story and a funny name and he was up for letting me name a beer well, that was good that it was. <laughs> so flavor profile how does it fit in does it fit in between uh, the favorite blonde and the IPA? Um, so the Fat Randy's? Yeah. Fat Randy's is the IPA. Oh, that's an IPA. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So that oh, one's. That is a, the IPA. Yeah. Okay. So that is the IPA. Yeah, I'm following really, really You're well. all right. So the, actually, the <laughs> I three. I had a different IPA. Nope. The three that we are tasting are, are year round beers that we have in cans and in distribution. And then um, we have a seasonal that rotates. And so. Pumpkin. The pumpkin right now because we're it's September. We're having a pumpkin beer getting ready to go into fall. And that will switch into a brand new beer that we're launching this winter, um, which we're going to launch a red beer this winter. Ooh. And then um, our wit will be back, which is our, our it's a wheat style beer, but we, it's called buckwit because we use buckwheat. Oh, I think I've had that. I think yeah. Is that a darker It's a really beer? summery. No, it's actually is light. Is seasonal? It is a seasonal. I thought that was a regular. It's not a so regular. So I am very anti-pumpkin anything. Okay. Pumpkin spice. Pumpkin Challenge spice. accepted. So I am, yeah, I'm excited to try it. <laughs> Didn't yeah. you have another dark beer at one time? You it, had the stout and something Yeah, else. we've had others. Like, we've had, a, well, we've had an imperial stout. We do that Santa's nightcap, which is a bourbon barrel-aged imperial oh, stout over the holidays. Um, we've had porters, which is a darker beer. The porter, that's the other one that mm -hmm. I really, really like. Mm -hmm. I couldn't decide which one I like better, the porter or the Old 93 Porter. It's just a little bit lighter than the stout, mm -hmm. um, but a great dark beer. Yeah, I love the flavor of the stout. I, I'm glad you do. I can't believe I like this. <laughs> the, you know, even I love that you do. My favorite blonde has really good flavor, even yeah. as it is, and I, and I, like, I like them all. Yeah, and the blonde, uh, you know, we came out with it a little more complex than just a bland beer because gluten free beers have that bland beer reputation. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to come out with something that was like, oh, they can really make a craft beer so with right. this. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going in. Going in pumpkin. Let me smell first. Mm -hmm. It smells pumpkin-y. Mm -hmm. So is this, well, you obviously add pumpkin spice flavor. So we it? actually you add. So you add flavoring too other than the four ingredients you talked about? Correct. So we add organic pumpkin to this, and then we add spices, cinnamon, allspice, clove, um, nutmeg. I can't. <laughs> You couldn't do it? She couldn't I do it. Go, oh, this is can't do it. It's, it's just, not, I mean, in itself, it's not bad. I, I have can't a, do it. Yeah, I, I can only Sorry. eat pumpkin spice in a pumpkin pie. That's, that's just me. Mm -hmm. The spice blend is actually very nice. It's more um, of a fall blend than like pumpkin in your face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, it isn't, it isn't bad at all. It's just, uh, it's just not something that I would drink. Drink. Yeah, and that's, that's totally okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to have another sip because it seems to be getting Maybe the next more, time. Yeah, mm. It seems to be getting a little more complex each sip I take. It also does not pair well with the flavors of the pizza. That's true. No, this, yeah, this would be. It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. That could be partly. I still have that pizza in my mouth. Mm, yeah. 
Yeah, Thai pumpkin spice pizza. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Starbucks will be releasing the uh, pumpkin spice yeah. Thai. I don't oh think so. Goodness. So yeah. So what have been some of the challenges um, since starting, you know, starting the brewery and growing it in, in the gluten-free world? I think one of our biggest challenges is that education piece around gluten-reduced and gluten-free pizza. And, or pizza, beer, and why it matters. It matters because you know people will still get sick from it, can still get sick from it. Um, and there's so much confusion and noise in that area. The, the restaurants don't understand it, the liquor stores don't understand it, the consumers don't understand it. So, so much of my job is going out and talking on a podcast or you know, doing a staff education with people at restaurants or liquor stores to help them really understand why there's a difference and why it matters. Right. Cause yeah. Most people, it, it's kind of like that on, on, on the pizza side where it's, it's, it's not a safety issue because all gluten-free pizza is, is gluten-free. It's, it's a flavor and a taste and a texture issue. Yeah. Issue. For the longest time, restaurants knew they had to give an option for the gluten-free mm -hmm. for, for pizza. And so they, they, whatever was available, they gave them. They didn't care yeah. how it tasted. Check the cheapest box. Right, and then the yeah. same, same thing, I'm sure, with beer. It's like, oh, what's the cheapest gluten-free beer? Yeah. We just have one, so we can make somebody happy. Yeah. Have somebody happy. Or we don't even need beer, we'll just do cider. Yeah. Like yep. Cider was very popular. Angry Orchard was yep. everywhere. Yep. And then, you know, better tasting things came along, like your beer and our pizza. And so we, we, we feel that we've been very instrumental in changing the way chefs see gluten free right. because they want to be proud of everything that's on their menu and they were never proud of their gluten free right and i'm sure the you know the bar managers who, who's making the, the decisions they want to be proud it's if true they would never drink the gluten free right. offering they're gonna you know you don't have their support so now exactly. they're, they're they're serving things they can be proud of and i think that's really changing everything for for gluten free consumers i think so too options. i think also people are underestimating the palates of the consumers mm -hmm. You know, they think, oh, they'll just be happy to have this. Right. Um, and they get nervous about uh, the price tag of some mm -hmm. things. And the consumer's just so happy to really have a quality product. I, I kind of say it seems like, you know, where you have a product, you can have a product that is very safe but tastes terrible right. or that tastes very good but isn't very safe. Right. But if when you find that crossroads of safety and quality, the consumer understands that. And they're willing to pay a couple extra dollars for a gluten-free pizza or an extra dollar for a gluten-free pint that is of a higher quality and it's just a better experience overall. And so I think that price awareness for the retailer or the restaurant, we have to help them understand that this is a different consumer. These people, they want just as high quality as everybody else and they will they spend 250% more at the grocery store than a regular shopper. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you and I know this, right? Um, but it's because I want stuff that tastes good. Right, and <laughs> they don't, we, we find this with um, grocery buyers. Um, we don't find this with restaurants as much. I think they, they've all gotten, mm -hmm. uh, come around to say, okay, if I, if I offer a quality product, my, my gluten-free customer will pay extra and yeah. won't complain. That was the biggest thing, that pushback we got yes. four years ago. It's like, well, I can't charge that much of an upcharge. I'm only charging like a dollar fifty now, and it's like, trust us, they will, they will pay, pay for it. it. If they feel like they're yes. getting the value for the money, they'll pay it. And we've never had a problem with that. Right. And then on the grocery side, a lot of the grocery buyers are, well, you know, look at all this gluten free, all these gluten free offerings. There's enough. Consumers are fine. They they don't need anymore. But we keep hearing from consumers, we want more options, totally. better taste, and better texture and quality. Yep. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. And then, of course, you've got all the gluten-free naysayers that are always going to be it's true. out and uh, commenting on posts. Yeah. And, um, yep. Yeah. And you know what? I, I don't do what I do for them, and you don't do what you do for no, them. No, you're they're right. They're a little annoying, but they're, uh, <laughs> they're getting to be fewer and far further between. I agree. Some of them are, are just nasty. Yeah. Gluten-free sucks. Well, I'm not sure why it's an emotional thing for people that aren't it. It doesn't make any sense. To, like, why do they care is really confusing to me if I know, I never Someone else, that. why is food an emotional... What I eat, why do you care what, what I eat? <laughs> I like, don't understand that. It was like yeah. a couple years ago when gluten-free was labeled a fad, which it's not a fad, obviously. Yeah. And, um, but everybody was so passionate about, 
you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't cut gluten out of your life. I don't understand it. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, why, why do you care? Yeah. If you ate, you know, a banana and the banana made you feel bad or you just didn't like the taste of the banana, yeah. whatever, you'd stop eating the banana. Now, am I going to give you crap for it? No. no. But why are you giving me crap right. for not eating gluten? Or, <laughs> and, you know, another thing I talk about with the gluten reduced fear is like, you don't see peanut reduced no, pizza that's or, a, that's a good point, or you know, you, <laughs> you know, so like, why is this even a thing? I'm really sort of confused and I, it's a cutting corner. It's interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's just a learning and education. So it's a challenge for us and it yeah. sounds like somewhat of a similar one for you guys. Yeah, and it's always a challenge uh -huh. and, and, and people drink your beer and their minds are changed. People eat our, our products, their minds are changed. Yep. So really we just always look at it as one, one slice of pizza at a time. Yep. And, Yep. And, and yeah, the flip side of that is once they do and their minds are changed, these consumers are so loyal, loyal. and awesome and supportive. And I mean, I get, I walk in the brewery and I get thank yous, like sincere thank yous. And I'm thinking, this was just selfish, but yeah. you're welcome. I just wanted, I just wanted to be <laughs> Exactly. Like, you know, we, I, we knew once we, when we created the crust and how good it was, we knew we, we had to share it at that point. Yeah. It was kind of like, it was our duty. Yeah. Get I mean, it out I, to I the can't world. I over here enjoying all this pizza and everybody else is like, oh, I wish I had some good pizza. It's just, I don't, I, I couldn't live with that. It's such a parallel story and just really wanting to get just get these things out to people and make it available and let them live and feel and right. be normal. Enjoy their lives and be as normal yeah. as possible with a situation that's anywhere nowhere near normal. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I feel exactly the same way. Yeah, very good. So I'm, get, I'm getting the nod. I'm getting the nod from the director slash producer slash husband. <laughs> Thank you so much. For yes. Me. This was great. It was I, a pleasure. I'm going to keep cooking Thai food. I think you should keep this pizza on the rotation. Definitely. And the beer, I, I love the pairing. It was great. And Thanks. Now, thank you for the beer education. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And uh, I'll have to get into the, to the tap room and, and try all the, the ones that come out. The newbies. We need to do that, Rich. For sure. All these beers are in the car. Yeah. Just don't do a peppermint beer. Well, that's not on the list. Okay. <laughs> All right, peppermint. peppermint. No, I won't do the peppermint. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.